Please be opening your Bibles to James chapter 4. In the last, in the closing chapters, in the closing chapter of the book of Colossians, Paul uh, encourages, encourages us to pray uh, uh, for others. And I spent, I think, three sermons on that. The last one, I thought I finished, I went back to chapter 1, where you have an incredible prayer that Paul brings across, and we can learn so much from it. We haven't finished with prayer. We have much more to say. And, of course, it's not going to be from the book of Colossians. We will look at a very well-known passage in James chapter 4. So I urge you to open your Bibles there. Chapter 4, we'll be reading verses 1 through 4. Now the title of this message is, When God Says No. We don't want to hear a no from God when we pray to Him, but there are times, and we'll be looking at them this afternoon, when God simply says, He doesn't say uh, yes, He doesn't say I'm going to give you something better. He doesn't even tell you uh, to wait. He simply says, no way. James chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. From whence comes wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lust that war is in your members? You lust and have not, you kill and decide to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you have not because you ask not. You ask and receive not, because you ask amiss, that you may consume it upon your lust. You adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Let's pray. Father, it's a lesson for us to learn here. Obviously, when we come before the throne of grace, we can bring our petitions. We, we want to hear a yes, a definite yes. Maybe even a, uh, I have something better for you. But Lord, there are times when you simply turn your eyes, you turn your, your face to the, another direction and uh, with a no expression. We don't want to face that situation, Lord, when we come to you. But we need to learn the, the, about the things that will uh, provoke you to say no when we pray. Lord, I pray that this afternoon you will help us understand uh, those six things that uh, will make you, Lord, just turn your head to another direction. I pray, Lord, that you will uh, get, equip me uh, to be able to uh, find the words in English that I need, and that your Spirit, Lord, will work through each one of us so that we learn to pray uh, better. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If I were to ask you this afternoon, what is your greatest privilege, what would you say? I mean, privilege before God. What would be your greatest privilege? And if I ask you then, what is your greatest failure, what would you answer to that? And I think prayer answers both questions. Prayer is our greatest privilege, but more than that, but, uh, but more often than not, it is our greatest failure. And there, we see in this passage that we're reading today, verse 2, verse 3, we, we see two major problems with prayer. A problem of unoffered prayer, unasked prayer, and then the problem <coughs> of unanswered prayer in verse 3. Either one causes lack of power and lack of God's blessing in our life. Um, if I asked you today, if you could tell me how many, if, if, you know, what things... Uh, how, how many ways can God answer prayer? I wonder if you'd be able to give me at least two of them. I'm going to give you four of them this afternoon. God can answer, and I, you know, I've, I've uh, chosen words that start with D so that we can remember much better. First, God can answer in a very direct way. He can just say, yes, absolutely. We ask and God immediately answers with no delay a very direct and very direct answer right on the spot and you get God's sovereign approval so you have the direct answer yes now if, this is what I want to hear all the time when I pray to God a very direct yes but then sometimes he 
also answers uh, by giving us something different than what we are asking, or something better. In Romans 8, 26, it gives us a good idea of how this happens. For example, it says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we shall pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be altered. Sometimes you don't know what to ask for. Or we say, we ask the Lord for something, and the Lord says, no, no, you need something better. I heard a preacher one time, a missionary, say, uh, Lord, I, I'm going to do, I'm going to be on furlough. I'm going to be driving for many, many hours, many weeks, many months. Uh, if you could just provide me an old car. And uh, the Lord gave him a brand new car, not an old car. He said, I didn't expect that to happen. The Lord knew that he didn't need an old car for so many miles. He needed a new one. So sometimes when we ask God for something, he just said, doesn't say, I'm going to give you exactly what you want. He said, no, I'm going to give you something different, something better. I, I like prayers to be answered that way. But sometimes the Lord just simply says, no, not yet. He delays them. In Isaiah 30, 18, it, it says, And therefore will the Lord wait that he may be glorious unto you. And therefore will he be exalted that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are they all that wait for him. So sometimes when you pray, sometimes you pray for months, sometimes you pray for years. I heard of, uh, about this a man that prayed for 50 years for something for the Lord to answer his prayer. He, he was certainly um, um, persistent. <coughs> And he, the, uh, the, the, his, his prayers was answered once he was on the coffin, after he died. Talk about delay. But then you have the last one. God may answer with a no. Uh, the answer might be denied, simply no way. And here in James 4, 3, it says, You ask and receive not because you ask amiss. The reason why God says no is given in the following verse, that you may consume it upon your lust. So why would God answer or say no to our prayers? Um, you know, if, you, if I, if I the, the lights went off this afternoon, and I asked, okay, what happened? Well, somebody would say, well, electricity failed. Well, electricity doesn't fail. So we could give that answer, well, electricity has failed, or Thomas Edison is a fraud. <laughs> or maybe some of you could say, Pastor, have we paid the bills? You would not say the electricity failed, but you could give them very different reasons for it. And probably, maybe it was because we simply didn't turn on the, the, the mechanical, the, the thing over there, to turn on the electricity. We, we, we have something that's interrupting the electricity from flowing. So why would God say no to our prayers? In order to understand why God would not answer our prayer, we first have to understand why God does answer our prayers. And this afternoon, I don't have three points for you, I have six. So that means we're going to be here until 7 o'clock. No, I'm not going to do that for you, with you. Six reasons why God, and when God says no, well, we have reasons why God would say yes. And one thing that we learn from Scripture is that we need to pray in His name. We need to understand what that means. The Lord says, whatever you pray, whatever you ask in my name, what does praying in His name mean? Then, you know, sometimes we can see that our prayers are not being answered because uh, we are not surrendered to the Spirit, to the Holy Spirit. We need to be surrendered. We need to pray in the Spirit. And then we have to pray in the will of God. Number four, we have to pray in obedience to His Word. And we have to pray in fellowship with God. And we have to pray with faith, without prayer, without faith. We will not receive anything. So let's look at each one of this. The, fir the first one I have here, we have to pray in His name. Now praying in, in, in His name involves having knowing Him as our personal Savior. Uh, I often I come across Catholics, you know, you talk to them about salvation, they had no clue 
But then they go ahead and pray to their father in heaven. I said, you know, if you're not saved, who's your father? Who are you praying to? You know, we need to know him as our personal Lord and Savior. We cannot call upon the Father in the name of Jesus if we are not born again and become a member of God's family. Uh, I hope you understand that there's two spiritual families that the Bible speaks about. One is the family of the devil. I hope no, none of you here belong to that family. And then you have the family of God. In John chapter 8, 44, it's interesting. If you turn there real fast, you will find that Jesus Christ is speaking to some Jews. And in verse chapter 8, verse 30 through 31, once he's speaking to them, it tells us that some believed. But then in chapter 8, 44, notice what the, uh, the Apostle John writes. In 144, just, just check with me first in chapter 8, uh, uh, chapter 8, verse 30 and 31. And he spake these words, and as he spake these words, many believed on him. You say, well, there you are. They are believers. So uh, they, they will be able to fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. But as the Lord continues speaking, you see in verse 44, something that's very direct and it says you are of your father the devil and the lust of your fathers you will do he was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him when he speaketh a lie he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of it you know you're not going to make a lot of friends if you go around there trying to evangelize and tell tell people you know you, you have, your father is the devil but that's exactly what Jesus Christ does with these Jews, who at first seemed to believe, but then later on they resisted Jesus Christ. So in order for us to be able to pray in Jesus' name, there has to be something, there has to be a relationship. And that relationship begins with salvation. You know, uh, I come from a Catholic background. <clears throat> I went from Catholicism to atheism, and then from there the Lord rescued me and uh, helped me understand what salvation is all about and what how, how Jesus brings about that salvation and, be, and I became a born-again Christian. But before that, with my, in my, my schoolmates, uh, all Catholic, they would uh, pray the Lord's Prayer, as you find it in, in Matthew chapter 6. Padre nuestro, I can do that still. Padre nuestro, que estás en los cielos santificados, a tu nombre, vengan a nosotros su reino. He just goes, blah, 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 blah. and you do that 30 times to be listened to, to be heard. And uh, maybe if you do it 60 times, you'll be able to be heard. You might be able to be heard. You have these things that people tell, and you'll see the nuns and the priests go along this way, thinking, well, maybe if I just repeat it long enough, God will listen. Then I understood that if you don't have salvation, if you're praying to your father, you might be praying to the wrong one, the one that you're not expecting, that is the devil. In John chapter 1, verses 12 to 13, the Lord tells us how we can come out of the family of the devil and become a member of God's family. Let me read it to you. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So in order to, if you want to be praying in Jesus' name, salvation needs to be first. You cannot come to God and pray to him without going to Jesus Christ. He's our bridge. John 14, 6. How many of you can quote that by memory? I'm the way. Jesus said, I I'm the way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And in order to be able to come to God, or be able to approach God, it has to come through, the, through Jesus Christ. And without Jesus Christ uh, in, in, the, in the throne of our hearts, without being saved, our prayers are just going in, in, in different directions, but they don't meet God. In John 14, verses 13 and 14, it says, and whatever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do. Now, <clears throat> let me give you an illustration of how this works. If, uh, if, you, if you would go to the store, 
when you ask the man for directions, and he tells you, well, uh, you take the right here, then you take the left over there, uh, but it's pretty far, it's very far away, so uh, um, I don't know, you might have to take the car. And you say, no, no, I will walk, I will go walking, no problem. And he says, too far to go by foot, I tell you what, I will, I tell you what I will do, I will get in my car and I will take you there. So what he's doing is two things, he not only points the way, but he becomes the way. So to pray to Jesus means that we need to pray for his approval. He must approve it. To pray uh, in his name also, it means that he, we pray, uh, to pray, here I'm thinking in Spanish now, to pray for his acclaim, for his glory, uh, to pray for his authority. Uh, we need to come through him, through his authority. So when we pray in Jesus' name, remember this, if you're not saved and you're praying, you're not getting very far. It would be like this man trying to get to a far city with, by walking. It's going to take a long time. You might never get there. Trying to get there by foot. No, he is, not, he only, Jesus Christ not only points the way, but he is the way. And then we need also to understand that we need to be surrendered. We have to pray in the Spirit. Paul speaks about this quite often. And to pray in the Spirit, you have to have a surrendered spirit. Now, you would ask, why in the Spirit? But simply because we have human weaknesses. Ephesians 18 tells us to be filled with the Spirit of God. And in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 15 through 17, after telling us to put all the armor of God, we are told that there is that we are we have a weak point in which we need help always. It says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, and watching thereon to without perseverance and supplication for the saints. Jude chapter 120. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your, on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. What is, what is this about praying in the Holy Ghost? Well, you know, you need to have a surrendered heart. Um, if, again, I, I come, and when, when I think about this, I, I come and go, I think of many different uh, situations that I found myself in. I remember a lady uh, used to come to this church, then stopped coming to church, and she had all her hopes that God would answer her prayer. For many, many months she didn't come. And of course I kept on contacting her and I said, you know, where is Jesus in your life? You don't come to church. Do you go to any church at all? No, I don't go to church, Pastor, but don't worry about me. I, I'm okay with the Lord. I have him in a corner of my heart. Every time I think of that story, it gets me, it gets me very irritated. And I told her, the Lord, the Lord doesn't want a corner of your heart. He wants the center of your heart. But I pray to him and I read the Bible, yeah, but what good does that do if you don't obey him, if you're not surrendered to him? Turn the Bible's place to Romans chapter 8, verses 22 through 28. Chapter 8. Look with me at verse 22, all the way to verse uh, 22 and 23. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of the body. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, Waiting for the adoption, I'm sorry, i repeat that twice. If you move over to verse 26, I want you to see something there. How we need the Holy Spirit to intervene for us, to mediate for us. In verse 26, it, it helps us understand what he said before that in verses 22 and 23. Look with me at verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we are, but the Spirit itself make an intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he 
make an intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Now, if you pay attention to that uh, word in, uh, in, in verse 22, it says, travail it in pain together until now. The word together is a compound word. It means together with and instead of. So we cannot reach the Father without Him, and He will not intercede for us without us. We need Him, and He needs us to make our petitions. So you might ask at this point, why do we need the Holy Spirit? Well, there are so many things to pray for and many, many ways to do to pray, make those prayers. You know, sometimes I have people in the church saying, Pastor, I have a situation. I don't even know how to pray to God. I don't even know what to ask for. Have you ever seen yourself in that situation where it's so complex? You just don't know. You come before the Lord and you, don't, you can't even utter a word. And you kind of groan inside the thinking, well, Lord, I hope you can make some sense of what I'm trying to say. We need the Holy Spirit because we, because of our, as Paul puts it, our infirmities, our weaknesses, and our human ignorance. We need the Holy Spirit because He inspires us, He guides us, He energizes us, He sustains our prayers. But there's another thing that we need to understand about prayer. We are to pray in the will of God. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 14 and 15, it says, and this is the confidence that we have in Him that if we ask anything according to His will, now we need to underline that, because if we miss it, we might just get things wrong. According to His will, He heareth us. And if we know uh, that He hear the, hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we desire of Him. So when you're saved, and your spirit filled, you will be praying in God's will. And uh, so I have several questions here. Do we want our prayers answered? Do we want the will of God in our life? Because if we say, no, I don't want God's will, I just want Him to answer my prayers. I would uh, tell somebody who says, you know, I don't really want to submit to God's will, but I hope He, he listens to me. I know that I have some pet sin in my life that I'm not ready to surrender, I'm not ready to release, but I'm still going to pray just in case. It'd be like uh, you know, holding this pet sin uh, tight in our chest and then saying, Lord, uh, I, I, I pray that you bless me in this and that, but you know, I want to hold this. I know this offends you, but this is my pet sin. This is something I cannot release, but just in case, well, Lord, please bless me here and bless me there. Now, if God answered a prayer like that, He'll be strengthening our rebellion. <clears throat> James tells us why we don't get our prayers answered. As we read before in James chapter 4, verse 2 through 4, Ye lust and have not, ye kill and decide to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you have not because you ask not. Okay, well, then I'll ask. Well, in this condition, you'll never get your prayers answered. So he goes on and says in verse 3, you ask and receive it not, because you ask amiss, you're going to miss all the time, that you may consume it upon your lust. The object of your prayer is not to glorify the Lord, is not to do God's will, it is only to satisfy your own longings. And he calls them by two names, you adulterers and adulteresses. Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity against God or with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. The Lord wants to bless us. He wants to answer our prayers. But in order for us, for Him to do that, we need to delight in the Lord. The psalmist puts it this way in Psalm 37, 4. Delight thyself also in the Lord. And what happens if we do that? And he says, and he shall give thee the desires of the heart. If the delight of your heart is his delight, then everything you be presenting to God in prayer will delight him. 
What determines our delights is our desires. And sometimes our desires are not in the right place. Sometimes we think we can just knock and continue knocking, ask and continue asking, seek and continue seeking, and find not. In fact, if you look at Matthew 7, 7, look with me there. I'd like you to turn there with me. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Matthew 7, 7. <clears throat> Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. But, you know, if we take this text out of the context, we'll be getting it all wrong. Pastor, I've been knocking, I've been asking, I've been seeking, and I've been doing it for many, many months, I've been doing it for years, and God seems silent. What's wrong? Well, that's in the context, because in Matthew chapter 6, 33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So we can be knocking, we can be pounding at God's door, we can be asking for, for hours, we can be seeking, and still find nothing. And it's because sometimes we simply, our heart is not in the right place. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And before you seek the kingdom of God, you need to seek the king. The king. You have to pray in the will of God. And there, and there are several instances where God did not answer prayer. In Luke chapter 12, verse 13 through 15, I pray, I ask you to please go there also. Luke chapter 12, Luke 12, verse 13. And one of the company, company said unto him, Master, speak to my mother that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a deliverer over you? And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisted not in the, in the abundance of things which he had possessed. So here's uh, one who comes and says, Lord, I want you to step into this situation. Uh, please uh, work so that my brother will divide the inheritance with me. And the Lord says, sorry, I can't answer that. I'm not going to step in. You're praying with a covetous spirit. I'm not getting into this. And, you know, here's a good example of how we can pray. Lord, please help me with this situation. Uh, we're hiding maybe covetousness, greediness, just self-interest. We're not looking towards what really pleases the Lord. Another thing, number four, we have to pray in obedience. It is foolish to pray if there is an unconfessed sin in our life. As I said before, if uh, we're, we are hiding, I call them pet sins, things that, pet sins that we don't really want to confess because we like them, we just want to keep them there. We'll confess all the other things, but this one, I want to keep this one close. And we know it's wrong. <laughs> We know we're not, we're not in God's will, and we just hold it in there, and we still go ahead and pray. Lord, I know I'm, I'm not in perfect harmony with you. I know what's wrong, but Lord, I'm still going to come to you and pray for you, that you will provide this for me. The Lord answered that kind of, uh, uh, in that kind of situation, he will be reinforcing our sin nature. But sometimes the Lord just says simply, no, that's not going to go that way. I need not only confessed sin, and I need you to depart from that. I need you to put that away. Now, let me show you some people who knew better. David, for example, knew better. In Psalm 66, 18, it says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. If I regard, if I consider iniquity, if I hold it in my heart, I'm not ready to let it go. If I... I know this is wrong, but, and I'm not ready to let it go. He says, the Lord will not hear me. I, I, I say I do better, and I say in chapter 1, verse 15 and 16, he says, and when you spread forth your arms, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil you're doing from 
uh, before mine eyes, cease to do evil. And also Samuel the prophet knew better in 1 Samuel 8.18 he says, And ye shall cry out in that day because your king which you shall have chosen you and the Lord will not hear you in that day. Sometimes we, we before we even, let's say for example that we're uh, time, in the time of the year where you're, you're electing an official for government. And you don't even consider their corruptness. And you say, well, oh, I kind of like this person. And you don't pray about it. And you don't consider what their, their, their character. And you vote for them. And then when things go wrong, you say, Lord, uh, uh, please help me with this situation. You know, the Lord would say, well, you know, next time you vote, make sure you vote for someone that has the right conditions. And, and, and by the way, it's becoming harder and harder every day. But sometimes we just... Go ahead and choose the one we like most without considering their spiritual character, their morality. Now, if there's one passage that, you know, illustrates this very well, it's in Joshua chapter 7, verse 7 through 12. If you turn your Bibles there real fast, I'll, I'll, I'll show you what I mean. In Joshua chapter 7. That's probably my phone, isn't it? <laughs> my goodness. Okay, just ignore it for a, it's not uh, too loud. In chapter 7, verse 7 through 12, and just, this is the, the occasion when uh, Joshua was told to conquer Jericho, and they did a tremendous job. The Lord just gave that city over to them. And later on, when this other little city called Ai was not far away, he just took, said, just take a few, uh, few thousand uh, men and just take it over. And of course, they were beaten uh, terribly because there was a, there was um, the, the the accursed thing was in the camp of the Israelites. And here in chapter seven, verse seven, it says, "And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over to Jordan to deliver us unto the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Would to God we had been, been content and dwelt in the other side of Jordan?" Now, what is it saying there? We were pretty, we were happy on the other side of Jordan. We didn't need to need trouble. Why come into this land and be beaten so severely? And so he's praying to God, Lord, what's going on? And look at verse 8. It says, Oh Lord, what shall I say when Israel turned their backs before the enemies? And the, Canaan, and the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it and shall environ us round and cut off our name from the earth and what will thou do un unto thy great name and notice what the Lord says and the Lord said unto Joshua get thee up wherefore liest thou thus upon the face now, in other words it's not time to pray right now Joshua it's time to clean up you know it's the Lord saying this now Joshua is, is broken down because of the situation but remember one thing, he did pray, he prayed about uh, Jericho, but when it came to this little city, we can handle that, we don't, I don't know if he thought about this, but it kind of feels this way, like, you know, this is easy, we can, we can handle this situation. But he didn't realize that the man called Achan, A-C-H-A-N, had taken the accursed thing, a, uh, a Babylonian cape and some gold uh, uh, lingots, where God said, no, that's mine. Don't touch that. That's mine. But this man said, no, I can, what a waste. I can take this home and I can uh, get, take, uh, get great gain from this. He buried it under his tent. Of course, Joshua didn't know. And uh, when he came to fight the, 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 the inhabitants of Ai, he was, the inhabitants of Ai smote those Israelites. So he's praying now. He's saying, Lord, what am I going to say to them? And Lord says, I'm going to tell you what you're going to do. Go to camp and clean camp. Now that's an interesting um, story. And I think there's a, a very interesting application for us. If we're holding something that we know is against God, that God does not like. And then we pretend to go come before him and say, Lord, please bless me. Knowing that there's something that you're holding from God or 
uh, some sinful situation that you're 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 holding to. Don't expect your prayers to go beyond the ceiling. Now, there's another illustration in Philippians chapter four nineteen. Notice what it says. We like to quote this. But my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Jesus Christ. And you say, well, there's a promise here. It's in there. I mean, God is saying, I will supply your needs according to his riches in glory by Jesus Christ. But again, we forget the context. If you read a few verses prior, in verse 7, 16 and 17, Paul says, for even in Thessalonica, you said once and again and once and again unto my necessity, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. And in verse 19, we see the promise. And there are two parts of this promise. I will provide for you. I will care for you. But again, there's a condition. There's a condition there. You provide for my work and I will take care of you. It's like, I think, like you imagine a, a soldier um, uh, enlisting and then uh, expecting the government or the, the army, whatever it is, to provide for his needs and provide uh, army and, you know, uh, uh, food and shelter and everything else, protection. But he doesn't want to go into the enemy lines. He doesn't want to move on. He doesn't want to obey his commander. He doesn't want to fight with the other soldiers. He just said, no, I'm going to stay home. But then I'm going to ask um, the military to provide for all my needs. This is why I'm in the military. No, uh, there is a condition here. You fight, we'll provide for you. We will take care of you. We will stand behind you. But we need to be ready to fight. Number five, we have to pray in fellowship. In Mark chapter 11, verse 25 and 26, it says, And when you stand praying, Forgive if you have ought if you had ought against any, that your father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. For if you if you do not forgive, neither will your father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. So what is it? If we're holding a grudge against somebody, maybe somebody in the church, maybe against our husband uh, or our wife, whatever. If we're holding a grudge. And then you say, Lord, uh, you know, I've done wrong, so please forgive me. And he says, yeah, but you haven't forgiven the individual you have right beside you. But, but, yeah, but, you know, that's, that's between him and I. And God says, no, it's not between him and you, it's between you and I. Before we can have a vertical relationship, we need to have a horizontal relationship with others. So imagine a little girl who comes you know, has a grudge against his mom, her mom. And then mom says, okay, honey, you need to go to your room and uh, uh, get put on your pajamas and say your prayers. And she goes to her bedroom and, and right there beside mama, she, she prays for dad, she prays for grandma, she prays for grandpa, for her brothers, for her cousins, then looks at mom and stops and then tells her, look, uh, look, uh, then looks at mom and says, I guess you noticed I'm not praying for you. She held a grudge against her mom. She's praying for everybody. I'm not praying for you. You think God would answer a prayer like that? <clears throat> and sometimes the grudge is between a man and his wife. In 1 Peter 3, 7, it says, Likewise, ye husbands, Dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto a weaker vessel, as and as being hairs together of the of, of the grace of life. Notice now that your prayers be not hindered. Number six, we have to pray in faith. Now that's no mystery. Praying to God without believing in God and believing Him when He tells us something, it's an offense to the Lord Himself. Matthew 21, 22 says, In all things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. Somebody put it this way, Pray and believe and you shall receive. Pray and doubt and you can do without. <laughs> Very simple. 
Hebrews 11, 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is rewarded them that diligently seek him. Coming to the Lord, it's, it's not because sometimes when you say, well, I have a lot of faith, but then we we don't finish the sentence. We have a lot of faith. People, you know, think that that's good enough. But what they're saying, I have a lot of faith in faith. Faith is only as good as the substance or the person you put it on. So don't say I have faith in God, but have faith in God. You know, it's Him, the emphasis. And when you put God in the center of your attention, it seems like your faith is prompted. It's like, for example, and I give this illustration when I teach uh, in the discipleship on, on the theme of prayer. It's like, you know, going through the Amazon and all of a sudden you come to a big uh, fall <clears throat> uh, and, and you have a very weak, um, you know, hanging bridge that's been there for 75 years and it's all kind of falling apart. And, 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 uh, and here's my buddy and I say, okay, we cross the bridge. He says, I don't know. Uh, if I can do that, well, just have faith. Well, you can have all the faith you want. That bridge is gonna, it's not going to hold on, you know. Have faith. It's not going to do it. Because you have a weak bridge. Now, if you have a, a solid uh, iron, uh, you know, steel bridge in concrete that can, hold, that can hold an elephant, that can hold a, a tank, then you don't really need a lot of faith, do you? Because you can't, the, the bridge can hold it. It can hold you. So when you say, have faith in God, it's not going to work this way. It's have faith in God. He's the one. He's the, the one you place your faith. Concentrate not on how much faith you have, but on how great He is to hold you. What is faith? <clears throat> faith is not positive thinking. Well, just think positively, they will tell you. Well, you can think as positive as you want. That's not going to do much. And it's not name it and claim it. I had a lady here years ago who uh, said she found an apartment uh, very close by, and she, it was for sale of course she didn't have any money and she said well the bible says that if i call uh, if i ask anything in in his name uh, he will give it to me and I, I pray that god would give me literally give me not buy literally give me that apartment and you know i've been doing this prayer for months and he hasn't given it to me and i said you missed something according to his will oh i didn't read that i thought he was failing me because you know it says to to ask him in his name, and I've been asking in his name, and he hasn't provided it. But I said, what did you want it for? Are you working? Are you willing to work? Are you willing to uh, pay, you know, carry your weight in the situation? Well, no, we're just hoping that God would give it to me. I had a young man, man years ago, back in the States, I was teaching on, <clears throat> on, on faith and on prayer, and I said, any of you uh, uh, come to the Lord in prayer? There was a 17 year old man, a young man there, he said, yeah, I'm asking the Lord for the most, um, the, 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 the cutting edge motorcycle with the, the, with the most brightest colors and, and, you know, with all the bells and all the whistles and, you know, all, the, all these things. And I'm hoping that God would give it to me. I said, what for? Because I like it. I said, that's not going to go very far. It's not naming and claiming. It is not working yourself into a, fr a, a frantic state. Like whipping yourself and things like that. <clears throat> it is not uh, wishing to make it so. Again, somebody put it this way. Faith is hearing from God, believing in God, and acting upon what you believe. Faith is hearing from God. That, that means get into the Word and try to find out what pleases Him. Right? Find out what delights Him. What's according to His will. How this is going to glorify Him. And then, in faith, bring it before the Lord, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, not positive thinking, not name it and claim it, not working yourself into a, fran a frantic state, not wishing to make it so. Faith is hearing from God. Are you listening to the Word when God is speaking to you? Believing, not in God, but believing God. Believing Him. And then acting upon what you believe.
So my conclusion for you this afternoon is, I mentioned six, six things, and if you do the first five, you will find faith to be automatic. Give your heart to Jesus. Be surrendered and filled with the Spirit of God. You begin to pray in obedience, and then you begin to pray in fellowship. And if you do this, you will see that God will open doors and bless you. We will be receiving uh, uh, the Lord. Uh, he will be opening his treasures to us. So, <clears throat> I guess I can bring this to a conclusion. Praying without giving your heart to Jesus is hypocrisy. It doesn't work. He sees it. He can see right through us. And so when you come to the Lord Jesus Christ, the, the first thing you should do, the first thing we should do is analyze our spiritual condition. Are we holding something that we know is true and we're not obeying it? Are we confessing it? Are we asking the Lord for help to deliver us from that situation? Because if we know that that's wrong and we still think that we can come before the, uh, before the Lord and pray and He was going to be a bless us, uh, the Lord sees right through that. I'll repeat each one so that you can remember. When God says no, well, if you're not saved and you pray to your Father, you might have somebody different from the Lord Himself answering with the prayer. Remember what we saw in uh, John chapter 8, 44. You are of your Father, the devil. Sometimes we pray, O Heavenly Father, but if you're not saved, you're praying to the devil. This is how it is. We have to pray in His name, that it's under His authority, because we belong to Him. We need to be surrendered. We need to not just commit it. You might say, well, Pastor, I come to church on Sunday. I read my Bible. I pray. Isn't that enough? No, well, you're just committing something. But how are you responding to His Lordship? <coughs> we need to be surrendered. We have to pray in the will of God. We need to get into the Word. Understand the Word. Respond to God's Word in obedience. We have to pray in His will. We have to pray in obedience. We have to pray in fellowship. Are we in fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ? Years ago, again, another lady came to me. Every time we had the Lord's Supper, she never wanted to participate. And this is many years ago, so I don't think I'm talking to anybody here this afternoon. I saw that in one occasion, she didn't want to participate in the Lord's Supper. So I approached her. I said, anything wrong? Can I help you? She said, well, no, I, there's just some things in my life that I, I, I need to sort out. And so I really can't participate. I really, so I understand. Uh, try to deal, deal with them and get them right. And uh, hopefully with next time we have the Lord's Supper, uh, you'll be able to participate. But two months later, we had the Lord's Supper again. She still didn't participate. Two months later, after that, two months after that, again we had the Lord's Supper. About, about six, seven months uh, down the line, she still did not participate in the Lord's Supper. So again I approached and I said, what is the problem? Well, Pastor, I have this situation I need to deal with and I don't think I can participate. So said, when are you going to deal with it? Well, I don't want to deal with it now. I said, but you know, it's, it's affecting not only your communion with God, it's affecting your Christian witness she had one of those pet sins that she did not want to release one of those things that you just want to hold on to this is mine but I still want the Lord to respond to my prayers we don't have that fellowship with the Lord we won't be able to pray in fellowship and then when you, you, when you pray in faith it's not about having more faith it's having a better understanding of the greatness of our Lord how great is he? He's not like that hanging bridge that 75 years old is rotting away. You would need a lot of faith, and even if you had all the faith in the world, that bridge would not hold you. But when you can concentrate on, the, on God himself, on that solid foundation, then your faith can be this small, and it can go a long way. If you have the faith of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, Move and it will move, the Lord said. It's not about how much faith you have, but on who you, you're laying that faith upon. So I think this, this helps, this should help us when we come before the Lord. If you're not saved this afternoon, I pray 
then you'll get that soul. Then you don't wait like this lady for seven months or maybe a year. Hopefully one day I will be able to sort this out. Deal with it now. You might not have another day. If you're not surrendered to the Lord, don't just say, well, you know, I'm, I'm okay. I, 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 I go to church and I read my Bible. And that should do. That should be enough. No, no. The Lord wants your heart. He doesn't want to be in a little corner of your heart. He wants to be in the center. And only then will you be able to pray in God's will the things that delight God. You'll be able to pray for things that might not go your way, but it goes God's way. You'll be praying in obedience. You'll be praying in fellowship. And you'll be praying in faith. Let's, have, let's stand and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we can find more situations this afternoon but time is gone my prayer this afternoon is, is that you will be able to find these six ingredients in my, in my life and then you'll be able to find these ingredients also in the life of my brothers and sisters here but there might be someone here this afternoon who still has not come to you for salvation as, has never experienced the new birth, has never received Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. But maybe they think that they can still come to church, read their Bible, and things will be okay. If this is not dealt with, Lord, there will be no way we could come to the Heavenly Father, Jehovah God, and the Lord Jesus Christ for Him to bless us. Help us understand that, Lord. Help every one of us understand that this afternoon. <laughs> And I pray, Lord, that we won't just um, be conformed with giving you a space in our life. That we become truly a living sacrifice, acceptable unto God, which is reasonable. Our reasonable service is for us to be surrendered completely. So, Lord, if we're holding anything there, if you, can, if you see something in our life that is just interfering in that relationship. Lord, I pray that you would put your light upon it and help us see it so that we can confess it, we can repent from it and get it and make things right. May you find in each one of us surrendered hearts. And Lord, to pray in your will, we need to understand what your will is first. And if we're not spending time in your word, if we're not being filled uh, abundantly with your word, Lord, it, it'll be if not impossible, almost impossible to the Lord to be able to pray according to your will. I pray, Lord, then, if you're showing something this afternoon that we will confess <coughs> you're showing something that's not right. If, there, if there's one of those, as I call them, pet sins in our life, that we will bring him before you, confess him, make things right, and be ready to obey you fully. I pray, Lord, that you'll find each one of us walking with you in perfect fellowship. Again, if there is something that's hindering that fellowship, I pray that you will show it to us and that we'll make things right before you. And for, Lord, help us not think about having great faith, but help us focus on how great you are so that when we pray, our faith will be boosted. When we look at you and your greatness, your mightiness, we won't really need that great faith, an amount of faith. We will put all our trust, all our confidence in you. I pray, Lord, you will help us with these things so that our prayers will be answered with a yes, a definite yes. Or maybe it, not now, but later. Or even, I have something better for you. But never, Lord, receive a definite no. A turning your face your, your face to another direction, your eyes to another direction, because you cannot even look at us the way we're walking. Lord, help us. Teach us how to pray better. Help us how to approach you better. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.